Welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. I am very excited to have as my guest today, Dr. Tamara McClintock-Greenberg. Tamara, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So Dr. Greenberg is a clinical psychologist in private practice in San Francisco, where she specializes in treating adults with depression, anxiety, relationship issues, trauma, and those who are coping with medical illness, either as a patient or affected family member. She also has extensive experience with older adults and their children regarding coping with dementia or other medical illnesses. In addition, Tamara treats couples as well as families with adult children. Her therapeutic approach is active and engaging, and she uses a variety of evidence-based techniques that focus on reducing symptoms and feeling more connected to others. Tamara has written a variety of books here, uh, and we're going to be talking about the Complex PTSD Coping Skills Workbook, an evidence-based approach to managing fear and anger, build confidence, and reclaim your identity. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. So before we get going, please share with the listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Oh, gosh. I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then raised actually in a small place north of Minneapolis in Minnesota. Okay. So awesome. Northern, Northern Anoka County, for those who are familiar with Minnesota, that's where I was raised. And then moved out here um, for the second time after graduate school. And I've been here ever since. Okay. So I've got to say, um, you, I mean, the books you've written and the the amount of books is really impressive and oh. inspiring. Um, but, and today, we're, again, we're going to be talking about your workbook, the Complex PTSD Coping Skills Workbook. But let's kind of ease into that. How the heck did you get into this field? Huh. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, I mean, it's sort of cliche in a way, but I, you know, in high school, I was always the kind of person that people came to with their problems. And um, I think in part, because I wanted people to like me, you know, I kind of would listen to whatever people had to say. Um, uh, And I don't know if I was particularly good at giving advice back then, to be honest. Um, But then when I went to, when I went to, well, I went to community college um, for a couple of years and I really wasn't sure what I was going to do then, although I did take a lot of psychology courses. When I had the opportunity to finish college, um, I majored in psychology and, you know, again, still wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I'd been working in the field, though, since since I was in community college, believe it or not, in uh, the eight. Yeah, I was I was 19 years old when I was hired by Child Protective Services. I had moved out here for a three year stint from the time that I was 18 to 21. And I lived up in Vallejo. So um, in Solano County, I was 19 years old. There was this pilot program to keep kids out of foster homes. And I had done some volunteer work in a group home when I was in high school. And they were looking for paraprofessionals to work with families who are um, reuniting with their kids, um, families who are at very high risk of losing their kids permanently because of Mm -hmm. neglect and abuse. And so I was like a... I don't know, kind of a quasi babysitter in some ways for the kids, but also taught parenting skills and did coaching and that sort of thing. And um, I was really good at it. I really loved it. And that kind of made me think like, boy, there's something to this, you know, that I could make a career out of doing this kind of a thing. So I worked with, to put myself through college, I did more of that kind of work. Well, um, let me let me interrupt you for one second. Yeah. If I may. Why did you like it? What about it did you like? Why were you so good at it? I mean, I I think like a lot of us, you know, I started the field by trying to 
you know, take care of my own parents, trying to fix my parents, you know, like this unconscious fantasy that if people get the right treatment, they can treat their children better. Um, but I think as I've matured, well, first of all, I've realized that's definitely not a good reason to <laughs> field or to stay in the field because it is a very fruitless endeavor. Um, I I really love I really love the work that that I've done and the writing that I've done has been really to kind of push the boundaries of people in the field where I feel like I don't feel like a lot of us have gotten really good training around a lot of things, to be honest, but particularly trauma. Um, I started, as, as you saw, I started writing about medical illness because one of my specialties was health psychology. And, um, you know, some people in my field, our field, don't take medical illness this seriously you know a lot of people are told that things are all in their head and illnesses are minimized um, but on the other side of that there's also been a lack of appreciation for the mind-body connection and how emotional issues can contribute to to physical suffering and certainly with trauma we know that that's very true um but i i think you know for me, I come from a lower class background and being in the field, I think, has been really good in that I get to translate a lot of ideas that I think are hard to understand. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a way that a lot of the writing, you know, I think of this about psychoanalysis for sure. I always say, and it's true, I don't really understand 90% of the papers that I've read, you know, and so I've kind of taken it on as a way to this work to try to translate some of these complex ideas and make them applicable for all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. I do feel like a lot of psychology has alienated, you know, all kinds of people, but particularly people from lower class backgrounds, which is something I deeply relate to. Right, right. Both on, uh, in, in terms of writing and also in terms of the practical aspect of actually getting therapy, receiving therapy, certainly. How you talk to people, um, you know, there's a way that I, I think, certainly myself as a patient, I've felt judged many times by people from upper class backgrounds who don't seem to understand my background. Um, I, I think also there's a way that therapists can, can really alienate clients by being, you know, by by pathologizing them, you know, and so the, the way that I work is to, I, I think most things people come to us with have normal aspects of them, they're developmentally appropriate, or were at one time. Um, and so I think we all need as therapists, we all need to take a stance that we're all in this together. Nobody's, mm -hmm. but just because you're in one side of the chair on one side of the chair, right, right in the right, whatever the, the therapist chair, um, doesn't mean that you necessarily know more or are better, you know? And so I, you know, I mean, people do see me as somebody who has something to offer, but I always make it clear to people like, look, I've been through a lot of this. I've done my own work. I'm just going to give you some ideas of how I think, how I think I can help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with that. I think it's a really valid point. Um, you know, unfortunately or not, the the whole system is set up such that from the get-go there's an imbalance within the relationship yeah. right yeah but let me ask you something so really interesting you talked about from the get-go you were working in this field at what point or how did you start did you say to yourself trauma this is interesting to me i want to work more in, intentionally in this field. What was that like for you? Right. Well, it's been around me from the beginning, right? I mean, obviously working for Child Protective Services, but I think I started writing about trauma. I had been writing about trauma as it relates to medical illness and the impact of traumatic backgrounds on medical illness, or also how people deal with aging or the impact of if you're a caretaker and you're taking care of a parent and there's been a traumatic history, I'd written about all that stuff, but really thinking about writing about complex PTSD, you're right. It's new, right? My, my 2020 book for professionals, you know, that was, that was my, my, my first book on trauma. And then this most recent book that came out um, last year uh, is my second book on trauma. So you're right. It's relatively new to write about it in such an intentional way. I think the thing that got me, this won't surprise you, I guess, given everything I've said so far, 
the thing that I think there's a lot of things about the way I think about complex PTSD, which I think are slightly different. But one of the things that I think that really motivated me to write about it is that a lot of people with complex PTSD get diagnosed with having personality disorders. And from its inception, personality disorder diagnoses have a very low iterator reliability coefficient rate. And that rate is 0.30. And what that means without being too, you know, into the weeds in this, but what that means is that three out of 10 clinicians are going to agree on what personality disorder diagnosis someone has. Mm-hmm. The criteria for personality disorders are overlapping. They are um inherently pathologizing. It implies that people can't get better. It implies that it also, I mean, the old teaching for personality disorders was people with personality disorders don't suffer. Everyone else around them suffers. But obviously that's not true. People who have, um, you know, severe issues related to developmental trauma are suffering a great deal. Um, And so I, I think that, you know, one thing that led me to write about it was to really challenge this notion that personality disorders are a flawed way to understand complex human suffering and human behavior. I I also think, you know, complex PTSD is frequently a euphemism for borderline personality disorder, um, you know, which is often applied to women um, and, and I think diagnosed in a way that is sexist. And so, that's really what motivated me to start writing about complex trauma. And then from there, it was realizing that there's very little good teaching on dissociation, yet there's all these different models on dissociation, and they are doing wildly different things in terms of how they're treating people, some of it without any empirical um, you know, support. And so I wanted to learn about that for myself, actually, and understand that, um, as well as share some of my ideas about dissociation. Um, and then I think adding in some of the the stuff that I have that that is incredible research coming out of England from Peter Fonagy and his colleagues about mentalization, applying that to complex PTSD. Mm-hmm. I think it's, you know, also I think a, a novel uh, approach. And then the final thing is anger. You know, one of the things that doesn't get talked about in the trauma literature is anger. Mm-hmm. And now anger is a very tricky thing, right? We have to be so careful in talking with clients about it because it's so easy for people to feel shamed and pathologized. But if you look at the if you look at all of the data on PTSD, there is less than two percent of papers that talk about anger and PTSD. They talk about everything else, but nobody talks about anger. And so the other thing that I wanted to contribute in my writing was to to really focus on this very vexing problem that we have as therapists, that we have as as clients. How do we how do we deal with our angry feelings? How do we help our clients deal with angry feelings um, without feeling ashamed and being able to use anger as a signal that that something's wrong, you know, that they wow. need to understand more about something that's going on um, without making people feel ashamed and pathologized? Wow. Let me remind everyone, I'm speaking with Tamara McClintic, Dr. Tamara McClintic-Greenberg. Just take a moment here to thank our sponsors. All right. So a lot there, exciting stuff there. I want to back up a little bit. And you you said that, um, well, earlier on, you said you felt a lot of people weren't getting the trauma training. Talk a little bit about that as we kind of move in here more to talk about this book. Yeah. I mean, the old teaching, and it still is, is that people who are traumatized have to develop a narrative of their experience. That was that was what I was taught. And I think that's what a lot of people are still taught. Well, the thing is, is with a lot of trauma, particularly complex PTSD, there may not be the narrative might be that there is no narrative. And so one of the things that I saw when I've been supervising um when I was in training is there's this pressure often to have people who have trauma histories to talk about what has happened to them. Um, it seems intuitively correct to do that, right? But I, I think the thing that I think some people in the field have missed is that 
pushing people to talk about trauma can be very destabilizing. We see that with exposure treatments, right? right they have right. very high dropout rates, as you know. Um, and so we have to be really careful. And I, I'm suggesting that actually people don't necessarily need to be able to unearth everything that's happened to them in order to get better. In fact, with complex PTSD, that may never even really be possible. So you kind of have to, you, there's a way that you can deal with the past while working in the present though, because if you believe in the psychoanalytic idea of a, of a dynamic unconscious, right? Then if you believe in that, which is basically that we're always reliving the past, right? Everything, everything that goes on in our life is influenced by the past including this interview, including how I treat my dogs, including how I talk to the mailman, whatever it is, it has to do with, it has to do with the past. It's always present. So we can focus on understanding relationship patterns, attachment, how people respond to stress, how people respond to, to relationship, the threat of loss, that sort of thing. We can do all of that without having to necessarily unearth things from the past. If people come in and they want to talk about the past, that's fine. And that's, great. But I think that there's been too much of an emphasis on you have to talk about A, B, and C, and then you'll be better. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as we know from people who, you know, studies of people who've been in analysis for 30, 40 years, you can talk about the past, you know, till the cows come home and they, you know, it can be all intellectual and people don't get any better that way either. So I, I think, you know, there's a way to really focus on helping people without re-traumatizing them. And that's my emphasis. So again, the book, uh, the Complex PTSD Coping Skills Workbook, let's start with uh, a definition of complex PTSD. Complex PTSD is very different from primary PTSD. Primary PTSD involves, you know, one to two severe uh, events that, that causes significant impairment, um, like psychic numbing, in, uh, intrusive thoughts, flashbacks, nightmares. Complex PTSD includes all of those, but has more um, disturbances in terms of uh, like it's disturbances of like, like, what do they call it? Like self-functioning. You can have dissociation. Um, you can have, uh, like dissociation, including losing track of time, amnesia, difficulty with memories, but also difficulties in relationships, not feeling safe in relationships, disorganized attachment for people who know that, who know that lingo. Um, and, uh, difficulty feeling satisfied in one's life choices. Even people who are ostensibly successful who have complex PTSD, they can feel very lost. And I and I think for me, I think of identity theft as a primary, as a primary symptom of complex PTSD. People can seem to be doing fine in their lives, but they really don't know who they are. They don't have a relationship with their own minds. Mm. Um, one of the things that, and I think of this as a consequence of um, kind of built in, uh, baked in uh, hypervigilance. If you think of hypervigilance as a as a cognitive style, and this is for those who are into uh, old uh, psychometric testing stuff, this was an idea from Exner. It's not original, but if you think of hypervigilance as a um, a cognitive style, you are always focused on the outside, not just to assess threats. I mean, that's obviously part of it, but the other part of it is you're always in someone else's minds because you need to know what they might do to you. You're always trying to size up everyone in your environment. So think about how that can be adaptive, really adaptive, right? You can make a great career as a therapist or a lawyer or a doctor out of doing that, right? But if you do it too much, you forget to pay attention to what's going on inside of you. You're constantly outsourcing every thought and feeling into everybody else. You're constantly letting other people define who you should be and how you should be. And so therefore you don't really know how to protect yourself when you're in dangerous situations. And so this kind of circles back to, well, complex PTSD, what is it? It's developmental trauma, it's early trauma, but then it leads into adult trauma. And part of the reason for that is being scientifically being a victim makes you you statistically more likely to be a victim again. However, if you are constantly in the minds of others, you can't learn from experience. So it's really hard to take care of yourself and to learn, okay, 
when a guy does this, for example, you know, when a guy does this or when a when a friend does this, I need to realize that they might be taking advantage of me and I need to back off or I need to set some boundaries or I need to get away. But if you're constantly in other people's minds, you can't do that Mm -hmm. because you're you're not in your own mind and you don't know how to take care of yourself. That's kind of a beyond the criteria way of how I think of complex PTSD. So is is the book for therapists, for survivors, both? Exactly. Yes, it's for it's for both. It's a workbook for it's a workbook for survivors, clients um, that you can do on your own or with a therapist. Um, Many, many therapists use the book with their clients. um, I've been hearing Um, and and, um, a lot of people just get it on their own and try to go through it. You know, different. I mean, the great thing about a workbook is you can just pick pieces of it that apply to you. Um, So but it is it is for both. Yeah. So if we can, can we talk about a particular exercise that is in the, can you break one out for us? Um, Sure. Related to anything. Yeah. Related to anything. Okay. Me, I, want, I want our, I want our listeners just to get a, a glimpse, a taste of what the book is about. Sure. I mean, how about dissociation since that's relatively infrequently talked about and very hard to understand. So there's a, so uh, there's a checklist that that a lot of people have commented on that they find really useful in terms of thinking about dissociation. Dissociation can be adaptive or maladaptive, right? Dissociation is when we leave a, a situation because we're stressed. Um, the old example of this is when you're driving down the highway and you miss your exit and you aren't aware of it until a couple exits later. And you're like, wait, how did I pass my exit? That's like normal dissociation. Extreme dissociation is when you're so stressed. Um, I think of it as anxiety that then leads to a fracture um, mm. that then leads for people to kind of leave their minds and their bodies. And um, at, at which point, you know, people can feel that they aren't even in their own bodies. They can feel like they're not alive. They can feel like robots. I've had a couple of clients tell me recently in severe dissociative episodes, they woke up and they didn't even recognize their partners or their surroundings. It's a horrible, it's a horrible symptom when it's severe. And so um, one of the, so there's a checklist for identifying kind of different ways that people dissociate from different models, by the way, there's a number of different models of dissociation. I lump them all together, take the best parts of all the models and help people think about what it might be to them. But to the point of exercises, the most simple, eloquent, best exercises for dissociation actually come from DBT and Marsha Linehan, you know, who who developed that theory and their grounding techniques. So so grounding techniques are just perfect for when we're stressed, mm-hmm. especially if you're at risk of becoming dissociative. And so grounding techniques are something like look out a window, pick one thing and describe it to yourself. So, you know, I'm looking out my window and I see these pink flowers and they have a a yellow st- a yellow uh, thing in the middle and the leaves are green, but one of them is browning at the edges, like that kind of thing. You go into like massive detail to describe something. Um, tactile sensations. Um, in my office, I have um, lavender oil. I have different oils that, that people can put on to ground themselves. Um, I also love like, you know, rocks with jagged edges that people mm-hmm. can touch. Um, sucking on sour candy, biting into an orange or a lemon, anything that will ground you is really good under periods of stress, particularly if you're going to become dissociative. Um, so, think, so you just kind of think of all the senses, like how do you engage the senses in a detailed way? It's getting yourself, it's getting yourself grounded into something in the physical world um, that can quiet, you know, some of the anxiety that can lead to dissociation. Would you uh, categorize uh, dissociation on a on a continuum of severity? You mentioned uh, anxiety in a sense. Yeah, I would. I absolutely would because I think. I mean, the people there's there's a bunch of people who talk about normal dissociation and describe that normal dissociation can even be daydreaming. You know, so 
But for me, when I think about dissociation, I, I think I think generally dissociation occurs in response to stressful external or internal stimuli. And so I do absolutely think of it on a continuum. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, it you know, normal dissociation is is healthy and it allows people to get away. I always joke like the best kind of normal dissociation is when you can be in a meeting with a really aggressive boss and they're just going on and on. And you can look at them and you can pretend like you're listening, but you're somewhere else completely like that's amazing. Right. That's great dissociation because you know, <laughs> you're protecting yourself from somebody who feels, you know, intrusive and hostile. But dissociation usually has a shelf life. It stops working over time um, because it can get more severe. And so eventually dissociation can feel like it can start off like, and I've seen clients like this, they're just kind of spacey and out of it. And, you know, they aren't really terribly uncomfortable, but as dissociation gets worse, if it does, then people start to feel really uncomfortable. They feel anxious about not being grounded in themselves. I think in part because people start to realize, oh, when I'm dissociative, bad things can happen. Mm -hmm. If I'm not paying attention, bad things can happen. I I think that's part of it. But I also think it just feels terrible to not be to not be grounded in yourself and to know that you aren't really sure what your thoughts and feelings are. I think that's what happens. Yeah. So I appreciate that. So that's just one example of an exercise in the book. In terms of uh, trauma treatment modalities, maybe those uh, geared more towards complex PTSD, I mean, there are innumerable modalities out there. How do you uh, conceptualize uh, or put a framework on all these different modalities how do you mean, like, conceptual? Well, in terms of, uh, let's say you have a, a, a student who's interested in learning about trauma. Yeah. Where do you start to encourage them to to learn more about it in terms of treatment? Yeah. Well, it's a really good question, and it's a really complicated question. I mean, the way I was trained, we learned all of the techniques and tools that there were to help people. And then we applied what we learned to who came in the door based on what their needs were. The problem with training today is, in my opinion, not to sound like a cranky old person, but the problem with training today and and with the field today is that there are these factions, And if you're a CBT clinician, you can't really learn about psychoanalysis. If you're Mm -hmm. DBT, you do just that. And what makes me anxious is that people learn one to two techniques and then they apply them to everybody who comes in the door. Mm-hmm. And and I and so I would say to somebody who's learning to do trauma treatment, you have to learn all the things there are to learn. And and, and be careful for things that are really faddish. You know, I, I think that would be the other thing I would say. Like, you know, the the current reliance on ketamine and psychedelics as being, you know, the panacea to treat all ills, it worries me. Um as does theories that have basically been around in other forms, like internal family systems is really big now, but that's recycled work from, you know, the eighties the and, you know, like mm-hmm. people in Europe do that use that when they, when they do, um, you know, quote part work for dissociative patients and stuff. So I, I I'd say learn the stuff that's been around for a long time that has empirical data supporting it. Um, and there's a lot of different schools, very different schools of thought. Psychodynamic therapy is very well validated for complex clients. CBT has a tremendous value in helping people um, in terms of providing tools. You know, ACT, DBT, all of the different theories that have been around a long time that have data to support them. I think we we owe it to our clients to learn all of them. Mm-hmm. We're doing everybody a disservice if we're learning just one or two things because our clients, sometimes they don't know. They mm-hmm. come to us and they're like, well, help me. And if, if you're just doing one thing, um, boy, I really worry about that. I really worry about EMDR would be a great example of that. I think that EMDR can be very helpful. The data shows it's helpful for, for primary PTSD for some people. Um, 
the data is not as strong for complex PTSD, I will add, but, but I feel sorry for clients who might go to an EMDR provider. And if that's all they get, right. not knowing that there's other options, that's what really worries me. So I mm-hmm. think we need to learn all the things, you know? Right, right, right. I mean, I would agree with that. The other side to that there, and I think it's, it's obvious. I mean, there's a reason why people only study a few modalities because it's time consuming and it's expensive <laughs> But additionally, um, there are a lot of modalities out there that are very popular for which there isn't any empirical I know. evidence. I know. What are your thoughts on that? I try to just be, I try to educate people, you know, I try to educate clients about the data. Um, I, I am, look, I'm not in the business of telling people what to do, but I, I try to just let people know what the data says. If somebody really wants to try something, you know, um, and that's what they want to do. Again, I, I'm I'm not one to stop them, but I think people are entitled to know what the data says. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, there's a lot of confusing messages out there, and it's really confusing for people. And and you're right about it being expensive and time consuming. But I learned. I mean, I learned in graduate school. Now, granted, there wasn't as many things around when I was in graduate school in the early 90s. But still, I learned all of the foundational approaches in, in graduate school. And so I do think if we could go back to training people, you know, in a more in a way where we teach integrative using integrative approaches, I, I do think that would help. Um, and I think the stuff that's not empirically, da- you know, not empirically uh, validated, we have to warn people about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so as we wind down here, what's the take home for this book? Who do you want to 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 get this book? I mean, I think it's really good for therapists who want to work with clients using multiple approaches, particularly for dealing with some of the really more complex things that a lot of us didn't have training in. So anger and dissociation, I think, are are, are really well covered um, in the book, as well as, um, you know, there's a chapter on substance abuse and dealing with that, as well as suicidality, um, which isn't really written about a lot. So I think for people who have, you know, complex clients who need a lot of support. I think the workbook can be a great adjunct, but a lot of, you know, people have written me and said that they've, you know, bought the book to use on themselves and they find it really validating and useful. Um, So before we go, I did want to ask you uh, to pull out that uh, a little more information on, on anger. Why did you feel it was important to include that? Well, because like I said, it's so not covered in the literature and then Um, Where anger has been addressed. So within the psychoanalysis, there's a a group of folks called Kleinians. They follow Melanie Klein's work. They deal with anger, but they deal with anger in a very specific way where they are very pathologizing about talking to clients about their anger. And so I wanted to get away from that, but I did want to figure out, well, how can we talk about this really difficult thing without making people feel pathologized and shamed and crazy? Um, It's just Anger is not really discussed in our culture. Mm. Um, I mean, it's lived right on social media. You have right. I mean, in, in, in politicians and stuff, you have you know incredible expressions of anger. But in terms of e- everyday life and us trying to figure out how to manage ourselves interpersonally, there's not a good guideline for that. Trauma survivors, including people who seem very angry, by the way, often they are terrified by aggressive feelings. Most people are terrified by aggressive feelings. And so my goal is to help people develop a relationship. We all have to develop a relationship with our anger um, in order to be assertive. We have to understand that anger is not going to kill us. It's not going to kill anyone else most of the time. Um, And we need to not worry, right? I mean, think about an everyday interaction. You want to tell your hairdresser that you're moving on. People worry about that. Mm -hmm. You tell your rideshare driver to slow down. You tell your friends you can't talk right now. Like little tiny things in life. These things can cause people to feel very anxious and guilty because it's a little way of being assertive. And so, uh, you know, a lot of work I've done on my around on myself has been around this. And I had great help from a therapist I saw a long time ago. But, you know, just 
imagine where you could tell someone no and not feel bad. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where I'm coming from because people who have trauma histories do not have that luxury. Mm. They feel terrible whenever they set any kind of limit. And in some cases, in really severe trauma, they worry that setting any kind of a limit is going to cause someone to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I try to help people deal with that when they're ready because life is just a hell of a lot easier when you can set limits. Well, the book sounds amazing. Again, the Complex PTSD Coping Skills Workbook. Where can people get it? It's on... It's in local booksellers, um, at least around here in San Francisco, but it's online at Amazon. It's also on the New Harbinger website, um, but it's on it's on all um, websites, uh, uh, online booksellers. Okay. And Tamara, what is the best way for people to get in contact with you? They can go to my website, which is Tamara-Greenberg.com. Okay. And we'll have that as well as the book linked up here at the show notes page at the traumatherapistpodcast.com. You are... A wealth of information. Love to have you back anytime. I mean, pick a book. We'll talk about it. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. Very sweet. You're welcome. And I appreciate you sharing your own uh, experience. Uh, it was awesome talking to you. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Take care.